right. Start with the recording. Um, let's see, might give a, a little bit longer to, for a few more people to log on, and then I'll get started. <clears throat> I think we're good. Um, good afternoon, everyone. I'm Lorelei Diverter with the IPM Institute's Pest Defense for Healthy Schools. And welcome to the July call for the North Central School IPM Working Group. On today's call, we'll hear from Nick Weiss of Prince of Peace, Priest, Prince of Peace Christian School to learn about his classroom experience with fungus gnats. Uh, Nick Weiss is a 16-year veteran teacher from Carrollton, Texas. He grew up on a conventional 100 acre farm in Saginaw, Michigan, growing corn, wheat, and soybeans, along with about 50 cattle. Uh, integrated pest management wasn't really part of the conversation during his childhood, but since teaching AP environmental science and starting some agricultural product projects at his school in Texas, it has become a topic of interest and learning. Um, and we will hear from him shortly, but before that, I wanna leave some time for working group updates. Um, a group of lead, Scientists and researchers of School IPM and members of this working group recently published a paper on improving environmental health in schools. This article was published in the Journal of Current Problems in Pediatric and Adolescent Healthcare. Our very own Leah McSherry was an author, but was unable to join us today. Um, if any authors are on today's call to give to give an update, um, feel free to unmute yourself and say a few words. I'm not seeing any right now. Um, since, since none of them are on the call, I can say a few words about it. Um, it highlights the common environmental challenges in schools and how that can affect student health and wellness outcomes. Uh, it also calls for stronger regulation that is not a voluntary element for schools and calls for the use of science-based standards to address environmental health issues sustainably. And I'll put a link to, the, to that in the chat as well. Uh, then on to funding. So funding for this working group is provided by the USDA National Institute of Food and Agriculture, Crop Protection, and Pest Management Program through the North Central IPM Center. And then we have a couple sponsorships as well. So our first one is from Pest Boss, which is a software company that empowers facility managers with the tools to conduct and oversee facility pest management inspections abatement activities and monitoring reporting. Uh, we were also fortunate enough to have them assist with revamping several of our websites. And then our final sponsor is Excluder, the global leader in rodent and pest exclusion products. Excluder offers a wide range of products for both commercial and residential applications. Their line of patented rodent proof products include fill fabric for gaps and cracks, entry door sweeps and vertical seals. Their products are trusted by pest control and facility management professionals worldwide to prevent rodents from entering a building. Okay. And then a few pest defense updates. So remember that our online training modules are free and open access. They off we offer them for nine different uh, groups of school staff. And um, we have a newsletter coming out next week, which will feature the paper and um, the Tick Academy. And if you're not subscribed to our newsletter, feel free to email me and I can get you subscribed. And then I also wanted to let you know about a recent in-person training that Dr. Green was able to perform last month um, in Draper, Utah. He did an in-person training for about 30 custodians that covered six, six different school districts. Um, they had a full day event with two sessions and Dr. Green taught introduction to IPM and a custodial IPM session. Um, and if you know any school districts in need of IPM training, let me know and I'd be happy to set up an in-person meeting. Um, we are looking for more people to interview for school IPM policy. Uh, we are going to be making a, a planning document with a bunch of different school IPM policies cataloged by state um, and hope to distribute that when it's finished. 
And then I have another reminder for the Tick Academy. This will be a two-day event hosted by the IPM Institute. This virtual event will feature presentations and experts in the Tick IPM field, including Tammy Johnson, Alexis White, Susan Paskiewicz, Bob Murray, Brian Allen, Kirby Stafford, and more. For more information, contact Leah McSherry or uh, scan, I guess the QR code's a little small there, but it is there. Or visit the Tick Academy website. And then one last reminder for our, our next webinar, which will be on se September 28th at 4 p.m. with Jose Flores and Howard Grashen of Integrated Pest Control Management, Inc., one of our most recent Green Shield certified clients. They have been working in uh, the pest control industry for a combined 32 years, and they'll discuss the recent California regulations on rodenticides and how they comply. And then they'll also discuss how they manage 19 public school districts, museums, colleges, and resorts. And then we're about to get to the presentation. So feel free to put any questions in the chat. And I have a quick poll for before that happens. So I'll launch that now. Um, how familiar are you with engaging students in IPM curriculum? All right, I'm getting a few answers here. Seems pretty even across the board so far. And that share. You guys seeing the results now? Yes, cool. And then I will make you the host, Nick. Switch to you. Here we go. Great, thank you. All right. Um, me one second. Okay, can you guys see my screen? Should be good to go. Um, do you have it in presentation? No, not yet. Okay. Let me, um, yeah, let me make it big. Okay, that's good. Fantastic. All right. Well, it's great to be here. Um, and I'm just getting excited, like hearing what you guys are saying. Uh, custodial IPM training. Um, I just talked to my custodian um, yesterday and just said, "Hey, do we have an IPM plan on campus?" And he said, "He said no. We're always behind. We're always kind of reactionary." Um, and so to hear that you guys do, you know, IPM, the IPM Institute does that kind of thing is exciting to me. Um, hearing some things on the California limits on rodenticides. I've uh, got some things that tie in here with that and what I'm thinking with, you know, dealing with rats outside. And anyway, um, it's cool. It's cool to be here. And I hope that what I share today kind of gives you guys some ideas for how to interact with students because I'm not a pest control expert. I'm more of a pest control learner. Um, I'm a really good teacher. I've been doing it a long time. Um, but I, uh, I, I just kind of learn as I go. Um, and this is one of those situations where the pest kind of hit us and we turned it into a learning experience. And so um, what you've got in front of you, this picture is just, this is my classroom. Um, it's, I renamed it the Grow Lab because we grow a lot of things in the lab now. These are aquaponic systems. And if you're familiar with aquaponics, you'll know. Uh, and if you're not, I'll, I'll tell you all about it. It's basically, you've got fish in a tank. The fish produce waste, all right? The waste is converted to a form that plants can absorb. Um, through a biofilter, and then the plants absorb and filter the water, and it goes back in the fish tank. And so it's a closed loop system. Um, the water is recycled and moved around on its own um, 24 hours a day, and it, it grows plants. It's amazing. But it also creates uh, environments for things like fungus gnats to grow, and it attracts aphids and things of that nature. And so this is what we're, we, we dealt with. For a year, I did this. This is like, these systems are now three years old. And so for a year, we did this and had no issues with any pests or anything like that. But then in year two, um, I had some crops that stayed in the system for a really long time. I, you know, I don't really do a whole lot of maintenance on them over the summer. Um, and we had some herbs in there and they, uh, 
um, I was harvesting them, you know, multiple times. So I like did like three or four clippings. And so a lot of organic material was getting into these like clay pebbles and it turned into a, an issue for the next year. And so anyway, we, we had fungus gnats and that was kind of the root of kind of dealing or kind of getting into this. All right. So before we dive a little bit more into that story, um, I want to share a little bit about fungus gnat biology, um, just so you're kind of up to speed on what we're dealing with here. So fungus gnat adults um, are pretty weak flyers. They fly sort of erratically. And what's kind of ironic and weird about them is that at least the, the species that we were dealing with, they tend to be drawn to the most annoying places. So they would like go right in front of your eyes as you were trying to listen or literally up your nose. Like you'd be sitting there, I'd be teaching and then all of a sudden a student would just go and it, it was a fungus net that was trying to get up their nose. Um, I don't know if it was just the fact that they couldn't fly straight or the fact that they were drawn to moisture coming out of your, no your, your mouth. Or, I don't know. I really don't know, but that's what it was. Um, eggs, there's every female lays a couple hundred, two to 300 eggs. Um, and so every one of those fungus gnats you swat, you're taking out about two or 300 eggs in the process. And then the larva um, is where most of the damage to like young plants and most of the eating happens. Um, I think all the eating happens. And then as it pupates, um, and back to adult, we kind of continue the cycle. Um, a few more things about fungus gnats that I learned. There are many different types of species of fungus gnats. Um, I, I don't know the specific one we had. Um, they're often confused with drain flies and fruit flies. They're harmful to young seedlings, um, but they're not harmful to mature plants. Um, I don't know if the fungus gnats don't eat the mature plants or just the fact that they don't maybe eat enough of the root enough to do a lot of damage to them. Um, but they're only really harmful to like seedling starts. Um, we had some issues two years ago, we planted 20 different varieties of cucumbers. And I remember there were two types of the cucumbers that just never made it out of the seedling stage. They died, they kind of sprouted and they died. And I was like, what is going on? And I, I kind of looked down and it looked like the stem was kind of half eaten off or whatever. And so I pulled it out and sure enough, there was larva there and some kind of worm and I didn't know what it was. At the time, I didn't really look into it because I was busy or something. And then sure enough, now I know it was fungus gnat larva that took out those seedlings. So, um, and then annoying too, they're annoying to us humans, of course. The fungus gnat will lay its eggs on the soil surface or on plant tissue just near the soil surface. So in terms of controlling, that's the area we're gonna be looking at to control mostly. And then they eat more than just fungus. While they are called fungus gnats, they will eat you know, root material. They'll eat any sort of like kind of decaying material. They also like algae and that sort of thing. So there's other things they eat other than just fungus. Um, fungus gnats can also spread disease um, pretty easily too, because they're just in contact with the parts that carry the disease. All right. So there's a little refresher on fungus gnat biology if you didn't know much about fungus gnat biology. All right, so here's here's our environment. Here is what we were kind of dealing with. Um, these two systems at the end, I have six total systems. The first four really don't, I don't have any issue with fungus gnat um, breeding coming out of them, right? Nothing comes out of them. But with these last two, these are called media bed systems. Um, and in a media bed system, you uh, the water kind of gets pumped in. It fills up to just below the surface of the clay pebbles, about an inch below those clay pebbles right there. And then the pump turns off and then it slowly drains out. At least that's how my systems are set up. And so, you know, you've got moist conditions. Um, you've got these plants in there where, you know, when you harvest, harvest these plants and plant new ones in over and over and over again, and no matter how much you kind of pull out the roots and pull out the dead material after you've harvested, um, you're always going to miss some. So there's always going to be some organic material that gets left behind. And then you can kind of see at the bottom of the picture here, there's some algae growing wherever the water kind of gets piped in. Um, there's, we're dealing with like nutrient, super nutrient rich water, high in nitrates. When you have nutrient rich water, and, and light in any situation, you're going to get algae. And so there's algae growth right here. And so it's like a prime breeding ground for, algae, for uh, fungus gnats. And so they got so thick at one point um, that they, the other thing is they're attracted to light as well. So I've got these couple windows right here. They would, uh, the adults would, you know, come out of their pup pupas. They would hit the windows. They would die. I don't know if it was like just, starving over against the window or they got too cold or whatever, but they would pile up on the sill right here. And at one point there was probably like a centimeter and a half of dead fungus gnats just sitting there. It was disgusting. 
And I don't look over there very often. I don't go and look out my windows here. Or I, I don't know. They just kind of got out of control. Now, in the classroom, they didn't really bother us. It, it wasn't like a thousand fungus gnats flying around us. It was always just kind of an annoyance here and there. This is just one of the areas where we had fungus gnats uh, breeding. Um, we also have this little stretch in the hallway where we grow several plants. The students do a project out here where they kind of compete and grow things against each other for fun in biology class. And so there's a breeding ground for fungus nests, that moist soil. The students, you know, typically they, they're learning how to water, so they might overwater and, you know, create even better conditions for fungus nests and so on and so forth. So, yeah, so that's there. And then we're really trying to expand our outdoor um, growing as well. Um, since we've had so much success with aquaponics, it's been so good for the kids. They love it. Um, we're kind of diving into doing more outdoor stuff. And so uh, we've been starting most of our seedlings indoors, which means lots of these pots sitting around. And we this year alone, we started like around 100 peppers and tomatoes. And, you know, when you got that many pots sitting around with that much moist soil and that much organic material, you're, you're just going to have a lot of fungus gnats. So that's kind of the... Uh, the groundwork for what that we made the perfect environment for fungus nests to survive and thrive um, and so on and so forth. So that led us to um, Operation Fungus Nets, which was just like we just decided as a class that we needed to to deal with this. Um, I, I kind of toyed around with going to my custodian and just asking like, hey, can you call somebody about this? But then I thought, you know, this is this is tricky. Like if I call a pest control company, I don't know what they're going to do. Um, they might come in with the chemical and like, but the thing is, is like in aquaponics, you have fish to deal with, you know, like you have to also know the biology of the fish you're dealing with and you can't always use the, the chemical control. And so like, for example, peroxide, um, you know, peroxide is one of the common chemical controls for a, for a fungus gnat. It kills the larva, kills the eggs, kills, uh, even kills the adults. And so, you know, but, but it's also going to be really abrasive to a fish's a fish kills, you know, so um, can't do that. So anyway, I I um just decided we were gonna we were gonna roll with this and we were gonna figure it out. Um, it also ties into the AP Environmental Science curriculum really well. So I'll just kind of pause and let you guys sort of soak this up. These are the objectives um, for the AP Environmental Science curriculum that deal with integrated pest management. All right. Um, and so, um, you know, you can see like it's, I need to cover all the different types of control before chemical controls. Um, and I also need to kind of connect to why is this good? Why do we do this? Um, and it is to protect wildlife, to kind of understand the environment as a whole and so on and so forth. Um, the thing at the end here really, really connects with the students too. Like the fact that it, it can be expensive and it requires a lot of knowledge. Like when you when you use IPM, you really have to be willing to to learn um, and to dig into it. And so that's something we really experienced as we went through this as well. All right. So um, how did we, you know, one of the first steps in IPM is sort of figuring out when you have a problem, right? Well, we knew we had a problem. We knew we were swatting fungus gnats and they were really annoying during class. But, you know, how many did we have? And so we did this really informal population study. Um, and what these numbers mean is whenever... Uh, a fungus gnat would bother a student. Like whenever they swatted at it or kind of like saw it and it distracted them, I wanted them to make a little mental note of when that was. And so they um, so they, they kind of kept that in their heads. And then at the end of class, I would just say, all right, uh, raise your hands. Like I'm just going around the class. How many fungus gnats bothered you today? One student would say two, three, four. And I would just add all of those up and put them on the board. And we did that for a while. We didn't do that the entire time. But uh, we just wanted to kind of see if the fungus gnat population was dropping. Um, our threshold for success, we were trying to just completely eliminate because we we wanted to just not be bothered by these things at all. And I know that sometimes IPM isn't about like complete, you know, obliteration. It's just about kind of getting it to a manageable level. But in our case, we really just didn't want to be distracted by fungus gnats. So we were, we were shooting for the moon here. All right, and this is what it looked like in my lesson, all right? I I, ha I had my normal activities that I was doing, and then all of a sudden at the end, I had this in groups develop an IPM strategy for controlling fungus gnats. And the first day was the biggest day um, because we needed to kind of develop all the different levels of how we were going to manage this pest. 
And so I designed a presentation, a collaborative presentation for the kids, um, and then kind of divvied out tasks for each of them. And I'll get into kind of how I did that in just a second. So day one was a big day. We probably spent like, I'd say about 30 minutes on this part, just sort of designing each step of the IPM strategy, but we did it in groups. Um, you know, and then from that point on, we just, uh, you know, once we would implement one level of IPM, we would kind of wait for a week um, and then see what happens. And so then the after that, it just kind of became a bell ringer. So at the beginning of class, we would look at the numbers and say, oh, well, that didn't work. Now we need to move on to the next level. And since I was kind of spreading these things out by a week or so, it was like a constant review, you know, so it wasn't just like you come in and a guest presenter and you tell them, tell them all about IPM and then that's it. I mean, that our brains just never do really well at remembering all that. So spreading it out week by week as we kind of implemented these different control methods was, was really effective at kind of bringing it up, um, getting them to ask more questions and so on and so forth. All right. And so the first thing we did was we did, you know, we did sticky traps and the sticky traps just didn't, didn't really work. I'll get into that in a second. All right. But that was kind of, this is what it looked like in my lesson. Um, then we'd go on another one. Let's see jumped into biological controls. That's just that's just kind of what it looked like in my lesson plan, okay? After the main kind of design of the whole IPM strategy. All right, so how did I do this? Well, I'm 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 a tech a tech guy. Um, I love using uh, Google Slides uh, and my, our, all of our students have devices and so this works for us. Um, you could totally do this a, a low tech version of this too um, if you provided students with the you know, the a publication or something that had control strategies in it or whatever, and you kind of had them pull information from there. But if they have devices and they can access the internet, um, they can get a lot of information to design an IPM plan, okay? So um, I, I usually go ahead and I make, um, I call them class collabs, but they're just a Google slide, it's a Google slide presentation and you share it, you kind of change the link to be editable by anybody and you push that link out to your students and then they can edit it and add to it. And so that's how I do it. Um, and it looks kind of like um, the opening slide. You, so you make a blank presentation. The opening slide has instructions for what the students are supposed to, to do in their teams. So I divided them up into, I think, four or five teams when I did this. And each team had to develop a slide or two that sort of described what they were gonna do for that specific control strategy, whether it was biological, cultural, physical, or so on and so forth, all right? And so then on that slide, you wanna make sure you're really clear about what information you want them to find, the design constraints, if you want them to like make the presentation look a certain way. Um, a lot of times when I make my students present, I ask them, I say pictures only, okay? I don't want any text on the slide, or I might limit it to pictures and titles only, that's it. Because when, I, when they get up there, I want them to be able to present. You know, I want them to kind of not necessarily memorize everything, and to have read enough to know how to talk about it, you know? And that's just a good a good teaching practice to kind of force your students to, to be verbal. And I know that's a little scary at first, but um, that's what we, that's what I've done. And it's it's been way better than those presentations where, you know, you just kind of read everything off the slide, right? Um, so then uh, tell them what you expect in terms of how much to talk. Um, and then, or, or everyone should speak at some point, you know, like all of those things are kind of decisions you get to make um, when you're creating that first slide. Um, and then this, this, the slides after that are kind of like, you can have the students make these or you can just kind of pre-make them yourself and you just put like each control strategy on there and then assign a control strategy for each group. And so group one goes out and finds a bunch of cultural controls. Group two goes and finds a bunch of physical controls and so on and so forth, all right? And then um, as time goes on, you know, you just kind of check back in and, you know, implement each one as, as needed uh, until the pest problem is kind of dealt with, okay? All right, so this is what it looked like. Like when, when, we, when we did this, you know, you're seeing the slides that my students kind of made, all right? So I made this slide, I put the title at the top um, and then the students put in pictures and text, all right? They kind of just sort of typed up the strategies that they'd come across. We didn't do everything here, we just did, um, just the bolded ones, all right? So we tried sticky traps um, and we tried just slapping. We were, we were already slapping them, all right? Because they were annoying us in class and the students got really, really good at smacking them. Um, but we put, we, I bought a pack of sticky traps off Amazon and I just set them in each of the aquaponics. I put two of them in the media bed systems and I put them all around the pots um, where everything was planted. And it was funny, like it, it just didn't work. Like it, a week later, 
I, I don't think I saw one fungus gnat on any of the sticky traps. They were located near the surface. Um, they were, you know, they seemed to be in the right spot and I just didn't, didn't catch any. And I don't know why that is. Maybe it's because fungus gnats aren't attracted to like yellow, like a lot of other insects are. Maybe it's because they're really just attracted to the moisture and, uh, and the, the organic material or something like that. Uh, that's kind of what I hypothesized. But anyway, sticky traps didn't really work. Slapping worked, but we needed more. <laughs> more. <laughs> All right. So then we moved on to um, cultural control. Um, and this, this was cool because, you know, sometimes the students would suggest something that clearly was not going to work. And, and that's like, that's a great opportunity for discussion, right? So they talked about like dropping the temperature. Um, you know, a lot of insects can't survive under a certain temperature. So, you know, I just, my daughter throughout this year, unfortunately got, got lice, you know, and when you treat lice, you can either get the freeze treatment or the hot treatment, right? To kind of get rid of them. They've got both of them now. It's really cool. Uh, but when you're in an aquaponics setting and you got to keep your fish alive, you can't, you can't do that. Um, we were growing some tilapia at the time and tilapia are a tropical fish. They really like it to be at about 80 degrees. That's, that's awesome for them. Um, but dropping a temperature would be a great way to kill some insects, but would also kill your fish, which would also crash our system. So we couldn't do that. So great conversations with that. So one thing um, I kind of had to help them out with cultural controls. Like they came up with a couple things that weren't going to work. And I came across this in some aquaponics forums. So I kind of just turned it into a, a discussion opportunity and sort of like uh, helped them out with this because this was kind of a, a deeper aquaponics thing. So these media bed systems, they, they cycle. Um, every The way that I had it set up at the beginning was about every 30 minutes or so, the pump would turn on. It would fill up the media bed and then it would slowly drain out. All right. And every 30 minutes, it would just repeat that. And so I was just giving so much moisture to the system more than it really needed. And as I read, I found out that um, you don't have to do that. Like you can let it just pump every two to three hours. Uh, and, and that's enough. Like the pebbles stay moist for, for those two or three hours and they don't dry out so much that it would hurt the plants. The plants actually do just fine in that environment. And so um, that was something I was really interested in because fungus gnats need moisture. And so if you can allow the top, you know, few inches of those clay pebbles to really dry out every three hours or two hours or so, that could do something. So, so we did it. Um, we went ahead and changed the repeat cycle timer so that it wouldn't pump as often. And unfortunately, it didn't really drop the, the numbers. We were still getting bothered by fungus gnats. We waited a week or two and it, it still didn't work for us. So I don't know if it just wasn't getting dry enough to kill the larva or whatever, but clearly it wasn't, wasn't doing the trick. Okay. So then uh, we got to the one we were sort of looking to the, looking forward to the most. Um, kids really got into this. I mean, biological controls are just so interesting and so fun. And so we came across predatory nematodes, nematodes, predatory mites, and they love, of course, predatory plants. <laughs> um, they even came up with peppermint, you know, like let's put peppermint on and sort of repel anything that's at our table. Um, so I went ahead and I purchased predatory nematodes um, and I applied them to the aquaponic systems. I applied it to all of the plants in the hallway and the plants in our biology lab. And um, it was interesting The in the biology lab, um, we checked in with him like a week later uh, or so later, and they, they said the problem was solved. Um, they weren't being bothered by fungus nets at all. Um, and the nematodes worked. And so then um, but in the aquapon in the grow lab, it, they were still around, you know, and so I don't know if there was some kind of difference between controlling with uh, the soil versus a, a media system or something but that was kind of interesting. And so um, I didn't do anything else with the biology lab, like we just kind of let that go. Um, the hallway was, you know, considered done. All right. Um, but then the we kind of needed to move on in the grow lab. And so I went and I purchased predatory mites as well. And then after predatory mites. Um, we noticed that the problem had seeded. All right, we weren't being bothered anymore. Um, they weren't like flying up our nose or anything like that, which was really, which was really great. We never got into the predatory plants. Um, I, I don't know why. Um, it would have been really cool, but I think we realized that some of those plants are also like tropical plants and it just isn't quite the right environment here to grow them. But man, if I had a greenhouse, I would have predatory plants all over the place just for a teaching tool and they're cool. They're just really cool. Um, I am growing herbs now over the summer um, for to kind of manage the pests as well, just so that there's not a whole lot for them to eat. Maybe over the summer they they won't 
you know, populate as much. Um, but anyway, I digress. That's more of an AFID issue we'll talk about some other time. All right. Uh, so this is the website I purchased my nematodes and mites from. Um, it's, I just came across this from Googling. I don't know if you guys know about it, but uh, they have like four or five different species of nematodes you can purchase. And it'll cost you like 15, 20 bucks for, I don't know, 5 million or whatever it is. And then you have to pay another 15 shipping. Um, but they're connected to Amazon as well. So if you ever want to buy something for a classroom situation, this is a great place to get it. Um, you can get uh, ladybugs and all that stuff. It's all all here, which is really cool. Um, so the the last step, you know, and I use this occasionally, but our problem was kind of solved by phase three. Like we fixed the problem with biological controls. It was awesome. All right. But then, um, you know, a few months later, they came back. Um, and so we also just kind of experimented occasionally with hydrogen peroxide. But I had this um, I had this kind of like aha moment and I shared this with the students too, but like with a chemical control, when you spray that on or you apply it, um, you're often killing like a lot of the biology, not just the biology that you want to target. And so I don't know why that didn't, I mean, I kind of knew that, but actually doing it in a classroom setting and applying the peroxide, I think it was the fact that I had applied nematodes and, and mites. And then I was like spraying peroxide on that. I'm like, I'm killing the nematodes. That's not good. You know, like it just, for whatever reason, it just didn't click until I did it, you know? Um, so, so that was cool. All right. So that's what they came up with for the chemical controls. And that was our plan that this was the thing that the students made in that 30 minutes. They just kind of threw that together and then we just spread it out and we kept implementing controls as the, as the year went on. Okay. Until we, you know, dealt with it. So anyway, um, this was kind of a summary of what we did, what I just talked about on the last couple slides. And we got to go through and talk about all these different controls and wow, it was really, really cool. All right, um, so where am I now? Where am I now? now uh, the, the fungus gnats are, you know, are still around. They're not as, um, not as prevalent, but they're still around here and there. I'm sitting here, I'm not, I haven't seen one. So I don't know why, um, I don't know. If I really don't know why. I don't know if there's still nematodes in the system or if that biology is still there. I just, I, I really don't know, but there's really not many around right now. Um, but overall, I would say this was just like a great experience for prepping for the AP exam because they could talk about IPM, whereas in previous years, they couldn't articulate uh, much of anything about it. Like they, at the end of the year, they had to be, we had to review a lot because they, they just clearly didn't remember it. And so just engaging in this and picking it up week by week was really effective. Um, we did our own pest treatment. We didn't have to call a pest control company, which is fantastic. And uh, yeah, it's gonna, it's just gonna continue expanding. We're always gonna have, we're always gonna have pests around our school. And so why not kind of expose students to the pests, tell them what the pests are doing, um, study the pests, all right, tie it into biology classes, whatever you got to do, you know, it's just such a great opportunity for learning. Um, in the future, I have a lot of ideas what I'm going to try this year. I, I had increased the pumping interval to two hours, but I'm going to up that to three. Um, I'll probably try companion planting some herbs in with like whatever we're growing this year. And then instead of peroxide, which I've kind of just, I realize is, is very destructive to a lot of um, just fleshy organisms, including nematodes and mites and so on and so forth. I want to try it. Well, I guess BT would be the same. <laughs> anyway, I might try BT. I've never used BT on anything before. So anyway, I might I might try that out as well, but we'll see. So that's kind of it. That was my experience experience um, and how I kind of decided to teach IPM this year. It kind of fell into my lap, but I'll do it again this year. Uh, I don't know what pest we're going to focus on. Maybe rabbits in the garden outside or rats around. I, I'm, I'm not really sure yet, but anyway. Feel free to ask any questions you want. Um, you can ask about the teaching side of it. You can ask about aquaponics side of it. Um, I know a little bit about fungus gnats, but I'm not like an expert at fungus gnat biology. So uh, feel free, dig in, ask some questions. Yeah, feel free to unmute yourself or put it in the chat. <clears throat> We did get a comment from Matt, who is uh, Matt Bauer, who was surprised that the Steinomera were effective in um, in the soil because there wasn't air available. Mm, yeah, 
Well, I don't know. The in the media bed systems, you know, the water rises up. Um, it never like goes over the clay pebbles. There's always like a couple inches where it's dry. Um, you know, it it'd be it's kind of like there's there's water and then there's a couple inches of dry, but it's then the water drains out and it's just okay. moist. stop Lana. Stop Lana. Dog. Okay. The control method that um, we the students were most interested in was definitely the the biological control, um, just because you know it's the most visible. I guess um, I don't know. And of course, getting into the predatory plants that's just that's just cool. Even though we didn't end up using them, like the fact that they got to look them up and they realized they were even there. The fact that you could buy like a nematode or a mite to kind of deal with this issue is super fascinating to them. So. Definitely the biological control. And I think that that goes over into other areas too. You know, like if you're managing rats or mice or something outside, um, installing owl boxes or things of that nature. Like when students see like an owl come to their campus or something like that, that's just, that's cool. That's way cooler than kind of messing with hydrogen peroxide or BT or something like that. <laughs> um, how disappointed were students when things didn't work? Um, man, I they're just they're just annoyed you know it, it's like sw swatting fungus gnats is not what you want to do in class right you want to just get down to business do what you need uh, to do. Don't get a GG. Uh, but yeah they that was i don't think they were really heartbroken they were just like uh, here we go again you know got to deal with the fungus gnats another week And uh, let's see another one from Matt. So for BT, it should be Israeliensis to control flies. So I guess that's something you could look at. Yeah. BT Israeliensis. Cool. Huh? Um, and then did you do anything to prevent fungus gnats? Yeah. Um, so in a hydroponic setup, it's it's hard because there's always going to be moisture there. Um, and there's always organic material, you know, like when we harvest, we do our best to pick out all the roots and the leaves and whatever, but there's always going to be something left over, you know. Um, I don't really know. I don't really know how to prevent how to prevent them in a hydroponic setup, you know, in in soil, like it seems to be a little easier in that maybe you just let the, you know, you bottom water instead of top water, or you don't water too much. Um, are there other prevention methods that I maybe don't know about? I'm sure they're out there. Were you able to take out the um, the media and like clean it or, or do you have to like take it out and clean the bins? You could, you can definitely take out the media and clean it. Um, it's a touchy thing though, because um, I don't know if you're familiar with like cycling any fish tank and kind of jump firing up the nitrogen cycle, it takes about a month. Um, and so you got to be really careful with all of the bacteria that's growing on the clay pebbles. Um, that is the biofilter for the whole system. So if you take it out and clean it, like say with city water or something like that, you risk killing all the bacteria on the pebbles. And then that kind of kills your biofilter. So then when the fish produce ammonia, um, if that bacteria isn't there to convert the ammonia to nitrate, then you they end up kind of poisoning them themselves with their own ammonia. It's crazy, but yeah. Let's see. Uh, wherever you have moist organic matter, you're gonna have fungus. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> yes, um, yes, sir. <laughs> I do have a few more questions that I had prepared too, so I can ask you them. Sure, go for it. So what are your plans of expanding IPM in your curriculum? I know you mentioned a few. Um, will you use it outdoors with your garden plot as well? For sure, yeah. So um, outdoor gardening, we have about a quarter of an acre that we're trying to develop, really just trying to produce vegetables for our, for our school, really working with our chef to do that. And, um, you know, growing up on a farm, I, I kind of know how to do that. Um, and it's it's been really fun to kind of dig into it. But we we have a ton of rabbits around. And uh, we we put up a fence. It was funny at, at um 
we purchased it and it was marketed as a rabbit fence. Um, and I should have known, you know, but it was like the bottom, I don't know, six inches or so are our one inch um, separation between the wires. And so the rabbits can't get through that. Most their babies. Um, rabbits can't really get through that. And then above that, it kind of changes to a two by two or three by three square. And so I just watched the rabbits. They were in the garden. They got through the fence we put up and I just watched them and they just put their paws up on the, you know, three by three square and jumped right through. That was it. Um, so rabbits are going to be something that we have to deal with. Um, and there are so many things out there in terms of, you know, how to deal with, with rabbits. Um, and so I might use that. Um, I don't know. I might kind of go that route. Uh, the fence is expensive, you know, like we could, we could totally put up another fence, but it's going to be like, a, like probably like a thousand dollars to put up a fence. And I don't know if we want to spend that kind of money and labor to do it. And so it might be more fun to try and find some other method for controlling them or dealing with them. Um, let's see what else. Um, rats, we, um, we had a compost pile last year. I had a student who was really into composting and he went two or three times a week to pick up the vegetable waste from the dining hall. And he took it out to a compost pile that we had just kind of thrown together with pallets. And another thing we teach in AP environmental science is kind of the benefits and drawbacks of composting. And so the benefits, of course, are you get this rich, high quality, you know, organic material that's that's good for a slow release fertilizer, water retention, all that good stuff. But then it also mentions that it it produ can produce um, nasty smells and uh, attract rodents. And so I kind of knew it was going to happen, you know, like he's throwing pineapples and watermelon rinds and all this stuff out there uh and yeah of course yeah probably like one month into it this thing starts I start to see like evidence of rats um and so this year I've kind of committed to the fact that we're not going to do um we're not going to do composting in like a pallet system like that where there's holes everywhere for the rats to get in we're going to build something that's sealed up and we're not going to deal with that because yesterday I went through and I kind of cleaned up the area I ripped apart all the pallets um, and it's been like over a hundred here in Texas for like at least two, three weeks. And we haven't been putting anything out there that's fresh, you know, but, um, as I was going through, like, I was surprised by at least like six or seven rats that came out of that thing. They scurried out. Um, they ran to the like electrical box with the, uh, at the business next door underneath their concrete pad. They just ran underneath that. One of them ran like up a tree. Um, oh my gosh, it was, uh, it was crazy, but, um, yeah, I, <laughs> I got to be careful with stuff like that, because if if these students, you know, who are mostly grown up in the suburbs, they're not farm kids. You know, if they see a rat, they're going to be like, oh, I'm never composting again. Like they'll just instantly turn off. Um, and so anyway, I cleaned everything up and that could be something that I kind of work with. I, I love the idea of, you know, building owl boxes or something like that to manage rodents. But at the same time, like our building is surrounded by those poison boxes that have rodents inside in them. And I figure if I, if I invite an owl in, I might just be like inviting them to their death because they're going to eat the, the rats who've eaten the rodents inside. So I don't know. I don't know. That's how it kind of tied in with the California thing you mentioned. Um, so yeah. Um, I, I, the only other thing I can think of is like plants, you know, like we have a lot of Bermuda grass and St. Augustine grass here, uh, purple nuts edge, it's really hard to get rid of. Um, the only pulling it out doesn't really work. Um, you have to suffocate it. Um, and so we've last year we spent a lot of time doing sheet mulching, which is basically laying down cardboard, uh, watering it so it kind of all sticks together and creates a nice mat. And then you put a really heavy mulch on top of that. And so we did that over the whole garden last year to kind of get rid of St. Augustine and and Bermuda or not St. Augustine, the nuts edge and the Bermuda. We'll continue to do that as a management strategy in our, our garden. So I might kind of get into the plant side of IPM as well. Yeah, let me know how that goes because we're trying to control some invasive species up here too. One sure, of our sure. Projects. Yeah. <laughs> well, it's kind of, it makes sense at a school because cardboard is in no short supply and kids are in no short supply and they love to get out there. I, I think the age group that responded most to the sheet mulching that enjoyed it the most was probably the middle school group. Um, our science teacher brought every single middle school class out and did a different section in the garden. And so we just kept collecting cardboard. People love feeling like they're part of something with the whole cardboard collection thing. So I made a collection area. People dumped off boxes, flattened them, 
um, they still had, you know, tape on them. It was kind of hard to deal with the tape. That's kind of a drawback, but uh, once it gets wet and, and whatever, it's easy to kind of pick it out and it's not that big of a deal. I say that, you know, maybe next year I'll regret saying that because we've got, there's a lot of it out there in the garden, but anyway, so yeah, it was a good experience for the kids to do that part too. Great. I wish you luck. Thanks. We had a couple more questions come in too. So, um, did any of the students want to go the nasty route and use uh, some toxic pesticide? Uh, no. Um, it's funny. They're really indifferent about it. Like they have no opinion about what to use or whatever they just kind of want to see it gone i don't think they even know what pesticides are available um i think there's enough in the media that says like pesticides or besides are are bad you know and so they just immediately sort of roll with that um and so yeah nobody was kind of like the uh um going for the the evil route i guess um and am i planning on making this a regular feature of my forward absolutely i mean it it'll be a different i think it's going to be a different pest every year um we'll have to figure out a different way of kind of tracking it um but i think at this point i think the rabbits would probably be the easiest one to kind of go with the one that they're going to connect with the most um there's just a lot of different levels that we can kind of take that one i love the comment about the beagle i mean i would love to get a beagle or some you know, school cats or something like that. I mean, that's what we did on the farm. Like we always had like 15 cats around to deal with rats and mice and whatever. And um, they just kind of, you, you just feed them every day and they just kind of take care of the problem on their own. It's, it's great. So yes, we need a beagle. We need a dog or something. <laughs> it's gotta be nocturnal though. See, that's, that's the thing. It's gotta be a nocturnal dog. I don't know if that exists. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I grew up on a farm too, so I'm no stranger to the rats in the barn. <laughs> yep. yep. Um, I have, have another question for you here. Um, what was this a hard lesson for your students to grasp? And or you know, what are, were their overall feelings towards integrated pest management? I know they weren't really into the um, pesticides, but just in for the whole system yeah um it wasn't it wasn't super hard for them to grasp um i think it's because we we broke it up so well you know it's not like the first time they all kind of had one slide that they were sort of focusing on in one control strategy i think if i were to have presented it like all at once you know and tried to expect them to remember it all at once that would have not been as effective but the fact that you know we broke it up so well that really helped them retain it um, and then, of course, at the end of the year, when you're studying for an AP exam, um, you're going to review all that stuff anyway. You're going to get these multiple choice questions that get you to identify like they'll they'll maybe like the question will be some sort of control method. And then you have to the, the options in the multiple choice will be like cultural, physical, chemical, et cetera. And they just have to identify it. So when you think about it, you know, just going through this learning strategy or whatever, those questions on IPM were like a drop in the bucket for him, which was really cool. Great. Yeah, I really liked your um, Google Slides cl classroom collab. I feel like that's a good way to um, give them clear gu guidelines and have a place to put it. Because we're also that's trying great. to do something similar with the, including students in um, a Green Shield certified evaluation. So trying to teach them IPM about like more structural IPM, but that might be a good way to get them. Involved. It works with it works with anything that you can kind of break up into pieces, you know. So it, even history teachers kind of breaking up different time periods or something, you can create a class collab that way too. So any content you have that can sort of be broken up into chunks like that, it works in that scenario. And there's and like I said, there's low tech versions and there's high tech versions. You could do that whole thing on poster paper as well. Like it doesn't have to be a Google Slides thing. Oh, then what kind of resources or organizations did you use to form like your IPM plan or you know kind of learn about IPM yourself? Um yeah, so resources. Um we we watched a bit of this documentary called The Biggest Little Fun. Um, if you guys aren't familiar with it, it's, it's great. Um, they use some IPM strategies in The Biggest Little Farm. And so 
we watched that and we kind of used that as somewhat of a, an intro, I guess. Um, I just connected to IPM as I went over it. Uh, and so that was kind of part of it, just to kind of get us into it. Um, and then outside of that, we just used Google. Um, there wasn't a specific website that I could point to that gave us most of our info. But in the future, I would love to use a more pointed resource, you know, something that's actually well researched and it's not just some kind of um, random homegrown method, you know, because there's everybody's got something for how they, some concoction for how they control things. Um, so yeah, I I would that that's a change I would like to make is just having a better resource because we did just use Google to find everything. Yeah, good to know. Um, oh yeah, and Rosemary Kelly made a good point that if you do teach students about pesticide options, um, teach them to read read and use the labels correctly. For um, sure. Yeah, for sure. It's easy to incorrectly use them if you don't read the label right. Yeah. Pesticides, yeah. herbicides, fertilizers, it's you know, all of it, all of that is hard to, well, read the label. Yes. Yeah. For sure. That's the law. <laughs> Did you bring up the subject of bed bugs and their control in schools? Man, I, you know, we have never had, as far as I know, we've never had an issue with bed bugs at our school. Um, lice has been going through our elementary school, but never have had bed bugs, thankfully. I, I'm not sure. I, I feel like our our uh, cleaning department um, bug bombs occasionally. Um, they, you know, we'll get an email once or twice a year. I think they do it around Christmas and then maybe once over the summer and they'll just say, please put all food away or something like that. And then they just say they're going to bug bomb the whole place. So I don't know. Bug maybe. bombs are terrible to use right. against bed bugs. Okay. Noted. Because they're, yeah, they're, they're, Typically, uh, a pyrethroidin, it has repellency. Mm. And you know, of course, you've just jinxed yourself. <laughs> How's that? Talk I'm about not bugs. having them, you're going to get them. Now I'm going to get bed bugs. Oh, boy. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> the CDC just had a bed bug issue. Mm -hmm. So they're everywhere. I'll keep my eyes open. Mm -hmm. All right, fantastic. Yeah. Then I do. Oh yeah, there we go. Uh, I do have one more uh, question. Do you know if your school has an IPM plan and policy for the interior and the grounds? I guess yeah. if they're planning, maybe, <laughs> maybe not. But um, would do you think you would include those structural pest management um, in your future lessons as well? Yeah. So if, I mean, if, if the groundskeeper had an IPM plan in place, I would, I would print it and I would give it to the students. Um, I don't know what I would have them do after that. I mean, just scan through it and maybe tell me like, what do you notice about this? You know, what patterns do you notice? Even before teaching them about IPM, I could just ask them like, what do you, what's, what's the same between each of these pests that you're dealing with or that we're trying to control? What's similar? for all of them. And they would probably say something, well, there's levels and there's numbers and um, they all end with this and they all start with this. You know, I think they would be able to recognize those patterns pretty quickly. And then I would, of course, a good teacher would ask why, why do you think they do that? Um, and that would bring up a lot of good conversations about, well, if you start with, you know, if you start with this, you kind of negate the impacts of this other thing. Um, so, so yeah, that's probably how I would use it. And Honestly, like if we had a trained person on staff that really knew what they were talking about with, you know, rat control or bed bug control or whatever it is, I'd probably have them come in and give a guest presentation or I would have them come in and just honestly, that would be kind of a cool like indoor field trip, you know, just like walk to all the areas of campus where we have pest issues. Be like, so here is where the rat infestation of 2020 happened, you know, or this is when the students like left out a bunch of crackers and the mice came in. Um, so, I mean, what a cool like indoor field trip opportunity just to kind of hear about all the pests because a lot of times, right, we, we try to keep the pests hush hush because some of them are kind of disgusting. Um, but if the students actually knew, like maybe they'd be more interested in kind of cleaning up after themselves and such. You should check with any urban entomologists at local universities or 
your public health entomologist because state I go and do exactly that, walk schools with pest control and we, you know, discuss options. Yeah, no, that's great. Educators and the, the uh, those people. And I'm a public health entomologist, so. Yeah, that's awesome. That's really cool. All right. Yeah. Do you, Do you know involved? of anyone in, or so you said, um, look for urban entomologists in my area. That was the suggestion? Yeah, at the universities, uh, they they probably have an, an urban entomologist teaching entomology. Um, they would be the, probably the best option for um, dealing with uh, pests in a, in a school setting. Okay, cool. No, that's really helpful. And I see that comment too, Mark, EPA, for sure. I go to that website quite a bit for my class. <laughs> kind of important. Yeah. Janet Hurley is out of Texas and she does um, training for IPM coordinators at school, I think. Mm -hmm. she might be a good person to reach out to. Janet Hurley? Yeah, yeah, I can send her information to you too. Yeah, that'd be great. That'd be awesome. Yeah, I know our custodian would love to you know, have a presentation. I know I would, I would sit in on that too. And we would probably develop something together, to be honest, because even though he's the custodian, like, I mean, I'm with all the gardening stuff I'm doing and agriculture indoors and outdoors, like I'm going to be a part of it. So it'd be fun to collaborate on that with them. I think you have a great program. I mean, what a wonderful way to teach kids reality and uh, biology and botany and stuff rather than just, you know, the, the same old thing from the same old textbook. Sure. Yeah, absolutely. And it kind of just fell in our laps, right? You know, it's nice to, to have a pest, but if we didn't have these aquaponic systems or if we weren't growing things, we probably wouldn't have fungus gnats. And if we weren't gardening outside, we wouldn't have bunnies. And so it's kind of interesting how, like you kind of need to be doing things to get the pest sometimes. And um, that, that just kind of fell in our laps. I guess you always have, rats and mice and things of that nature, but yeah. I think we're getting to the end here. I'm gonna do that second poll quick. You guys will participate. I get to it. All right, I'm gonna launch that now. And Marsha Anderson, she was, she's still on? She was earlier. She's a contact. All right, cool. Got a 100%, yes. So that's good. This webinar has been effective. Uh -huh. All right. So I think right about at the end here. So I wanna thank you, Nick, for presenting. It was very good, very informative. I really enjoyed it. Awesome, you're welcome.